We would like to begin with a truth warning. This short talk will unpack the realities of experiences we face as Indigenous women. This includes mentions of rape, sexual assault, and violence. As a listener, please take care. Although some of our truths may be difficult to hear, please recognize they are even harder to live, experience, and carry through intergenerational and vicarious trauma. And despite these truths, Indigenous women will keep existing, resisting, and thriving because it is in our blood. This is Little Indian Girl, resilient and worthy. Being born an Indigenous woman makes me more likely to become a victim of violence. More than 80% of Native American women suffer from violence, and in some communities, that percentage is higher. In family gatherings and community events, it's almost always a topic. Women who look like us are stolen in public places, in broad daylight. They go missing or are murdered. Matriarchs in my family are survivors of violence. And the first time I was taught how to defend myself was at a very young age at one of those family gatherings. My auntie taught us to kick, fight and scream and not stop till we are safe. She told me that I am resilient and worthy. Myself, I was almost taken. And as a result, I have to take extra precautions daily from checking locks in unknown hotel rooms, having a plan of escape in an unfamiliar location, constantly dropping pins when I wanna go out on a run, holding my keys as I enter a parking garage, making a safety plan and reminding my family that if there ever comes a time that I don't check in or I don't show up where expected, that they look for me and they do not stop until I am found. Part of my safety plan that I wanna share with you is that if I am taken from this journey of life, that my family honors and celebrates me the Indian way through feeds, giveaway and dances in my honor. I want to make one thing clear before we move on. This land was never discovered. It has been cared for by our ancestors since the beginning of creation. Yet as colonizers set out to steal and settle these lands, these thriving indigenous communities were pillaged and populations desecrated. Native women existed outside of any colonial conception of who or what a woman is supposed to be. And thus Native women bore the brunt of colonization as their bodies were sexualized, fetishized, attacked, and mutilated. During the first 40 years of colonization, over 12 million Native people were killed. 12 million relatives, elders, men, women, children, medicine people, teachers, leaders, and since then, Indigenous women have had to live with the threat of violence against our lives as targets were placed on our bodies. To further aid in colonial violence, terror, and exploitations, Europeans also introduced rape as a tool of destruction. In the words of Dr. Sarah Deer of the Muscogee Creek Nation, rape in the lives of Native women is not an epidemic of recent, mysterious origin. Instead, Rape is a fundamental result of colonialism and a history of violence reaching back centuries. I'm going to read now a part of a letter uh, written to Columbus, which mentions rape and his conquest. When I was in a boat, I captured a very beautiful Carib woman. Having brought her into my cabin, she is being naked as their custom. I conceived desire to take my pleasure. I wanted to put my desire into execution, but she was unwilling for me to do so and treated me with her nails in such a wise that I would have preferred never to have begun. But seeing this, I took a rope end and thrashed her well, following which she produced such screaming and wailing and would cause you not to believe your ears. Finally, we reached an agreement that such I can tell you, she seemed to have been raised in a veritable school of harlots. Early descriptions of this new world were equated with indigenous virginity, femininity, and womanhood, open and available to sexual exploration and conquest. Native women were seen by Europeans as exotic and sexual beings, open and available to the colonial eye and desire. Their tyranny had the power to even dehumanize our languages and place them among their swords and diseases as weapons. Squaw and variations of this word come from languages in the Algonquin family, meaning woman, 
or from the Mohawk word for vagina. In the early 1600s, it appeared to have been co-opted by colonists to refer to indigenous women and soon took on a derogatory meaning. In 1883, Lieutenant James W. Steele in his memoirs described, quote, the universal squaw, squat, angular, pig-eyed, ragged, wretched, and insect haunted, end quote. This is how the white world saw my ancestors and the matriarchs that fought for my existence. It seems in just a few words, the white man's language could so easily degrade and subhumanize indigenous women when that word was never theirs to begin with. They then took that stolen word and begin to name places across these stolen lands, Squaw Valley, Squaw Peak and Squaw Mountain appear all over this country still to this day. Landmarks, geographic sites, films, memoirs bear the name Squaw, as if to tell indigenous women that we cannot fully exist within this world, that we cannot fully exist without the white man's permission. And why do we continue to use this derogatory word? Next time you hear or see it, Remember the assaults against stolen lands, stolen bodies, and even stolen language that left lasting wounds across our worlds and our hearts. Remember my ancestors. Remember me. I am resilient and worthy. To the colonizer, Native women were savages and less than human, but to the matrilineal and matriarchal communities our women came from, many of which have no word for rape and murder, our women were revered, loved, and held great power. And if that power was compromised, there was accountability. Our women were educators, knowledge keepers, healers, leaders, life givers, and existed at the heart of communities, traditions, and culture. Our people recognize women to be resilient and worthy. Many tribal histories tell of power of feminine figures within their creation and origin stories, such as changing women among Kendra's people, the Diné and Sky Woman of the Haudenosaunee. Maybe you know of a prominent female figure. My people, the Stritsa'umsh, the Coeur d'Alene people have a ceremony for our women called scalp dance. After our men returned from war parties, they placed their war bonnets on the matriarchs and painted their faces of war paint. They adorned our women with items from war and gifted women their horses. This ceremony was to truly honor and recognize women to be the warriors of our people and caretakers of the community through the ceremony. With the onset of colonization, that recognition has been lost. So take a moment and imagine the way that the world was in areas that are today considered rural were once highly populated by indigenous people. That's what Sand Creek was with over a thousand Cheyenne and Arapaho living in teepees at the end of the reservation land. And while in peace negotiations, cavalrymen appeared opening fire on the Cheyenne and Arapaho of the event, a cavalryman recalled attacking 900 to 1,000 warriors strong. His men, he said, waged a ferocious battle ending in a great victory, the death of several chiefs and a near annihilation of a tribe. He continues, hundreds of women and children were coming towards us and getting on their knees begging for mercy, only to be shot and have their brains beaten out by men professing to be civilized. Soldiers not only scalped the dead by cutting off their ears and the private parts of chiefs, squat snatches were cut out for trophies, end quote. Of the, death that, of the deaths that day, two thirds were women and children. And before departing, the troops burned the villages and mutilated the dead, carrying off body parts as badges of honor. There's a proverb that says, a nation is not conquered until the hearts of the women are on the ground, then it is finished no matter how brave its warriors or how strong their weapons. This senseless act of violence at the Battle of Sand Creek was a direct attempt to conquer the Cheyenne and Arapaho nations, and they failed to do so. As long as our hearts beat and our feet are on the ground, we will never be conquered, for we are resilient and worthy. Today, the United States Department of Justice found that indigenous women face murder rates that are more than 10 times the national average. Homicide is the third leading cause of death for indigenous young women ages 10 to 24, and the fifth leading cause of death 
for Indigenous women ages 25 to 34. 67% of cases of rape and sexual assault against Native women report the offender as non-Native. Another study found that over 95% of cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two spirits, referred to here later as MMIWG2S, are never covered by national or international media. I'm sure you agree. These statistics only begin to show the severity of violence and invisibility we face. There are too many reasons to explain this reality our people, our communities, our families, and our sisters face. Data on these cases are not recorded and even kept in a centralized resource for law enforcement. Families are not taken seriously when they try to report their loved one missing. Oftentimes, a victim's race is misidentified and defaulted to white. There is a lack of coordination between federal and tribal jurisdictions, and evidence is lost, mishandled, or not even collected. Additionally, information will be logged incorrectly to alleviate an investigation, so departments do not have to expend time and resources on looking for our women. Despite footprints found leading up to a young girl's window, despite the fingerprints found on her window seal, despite the fact that the weapon that she was shot with was too long for her arms to reach herself, a murder is ruled a suicide. Sovereign tribal nations are not even afforded the right to prosecute offenders who are often non-native and commit crimes against indigenous women. In many cases, jurisdiction then falls to the federal government who often do not pursue action or justice for the victims. From 2005 to 2009, the Government Accountability Office found that the United States attorneys declined to prosecute nearly 52% of violent crimes in Indian country. While many tribal nations remain helpless in trying to protect their women, the federal government continues to do nothing while our women become victims, go missing, or are killed at higher rates than any other group in the nation. Why is that? Murderers, rapists, and abusers who are often non-native capitalize on the injustice because they know that they'll walk free and are inclined to commit their crimes again and again without fear. Indigenous, trans, two-spirit, gender expansives, and LGBTQIA individuals encounter discrimination, stigmatization, and traumatic experiences of violence at disproportionately higher rates than their heterosexual and cisgender counterparts. As a result of continued historical and intergenerational trauma, our two-spirit and third-gender relatives are often a forgotten and underserved population in all areas, including child welfare, violence of all forms, and human trafficking. In 2015, two out of every three trans and two-spirit identifying indigenous person reported experiencing sexual violence at some point in their lifetimes. Aubrey Dameron, a 25-year-old transgender woman and citizen of the Cherokee Nation, has been missing for over two years. According to her mother, Aubrey left the house at approximately 3.30 a.m. with only her cell phone and was wearing all black. When her mother asked where she was off to, Aubrey simply stated that she was going out to meet someone. Aubrey was epileptic and on anti-seizure medication, which she did not take with her when leaving home the morning she went missing. So it is not believed that she planned to be gone for an extended period of time. Her cell phone pinged one last time near her home around 3.42 a.m., then was shut off or died, and she would never be seen or heard from again. Yet, law enforcement did not begin working on her case until two weeks after she was reported missing. Aubrey grew up in a small town where she was bullied for most of her life, gawked at, endured name-calling, and was banned from churches. Experiences like Aubrey's are often motivated by intolerance, fear, or hatred of gender identity and gender expression in every social context. Homes, schools, communities, religious and spiritual centers, public spaces, and health institutions. One study of gender diverse and two-spirit indigenous people found that 73% had experienced some form of violence due to transphobia. In spite of this, 
Aubrey would tell those close to her that instead of retaliation, everyone should pray for one another. Aubrey's family said she opened her home to those in need of shelter, forgave those who persecuted her, and wrapped her loved ones in hugs and kisses. Aubrey was worthy of life. I am resilient for Aubrey. If anyone has any information about this case, please contact the o Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation or the Delaware County Sheriff Department. Selena Not Afraid was a 16-year-old girl from the Crow and Dakota Nations. She was last seen on New Year's Day in 2020 at a desolate rest stop in Montana. Reports share that she was in a van full of friends when car trouble forced them to pull over to the rest stop. And while waiting for a new ride with another woman, Selena went missing. That night, temperatures dropped to tw the 20s, and according to those who last saw her, Selena was not dressed for such weather. In response to the inactivity of law enforcement, the family held their own searches as soon as she went missing. Too often, families of MMIWG are left with no other option than to scour vast areas in searching for their missing loved ones. I'm sure if she were your relative, you would have done the same. And after nearly three weeks of searching, her body was found within one mile of the rest stop. Her death was ruled an accident, and according to her autopsy, Selena died of hypothermia. Selena's family does not believe that Selena went into the van willingly as they've raised her to be aware and the importance of being safe. There's an ongoing investigation of her death. Selena was stripped of a life. She loved horses and playing basketball. She was described as loving and always positive. And her friends said that she always offered a shoulder to lean on. She didn't deserve this. She was worthy of a life. I am resilient for Selena. If anyone has information about Selena's death, please contact the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office. Indigenous women and girls are 16 times more likely to go missing or be murdered than white women in Canada. In response, the Canadian government has declared this a national crisis and a Canadian genocide when it was discovered that more than 1,000 Indigenous women were murdered over the span of 30 years. The highest number of cases were reported in British Columbia many of which occurred along the Highway of Tears, a 450 mile corridor of Highway 16 between Prince George and Prince Rupert. The rural road passes through forests, logging towns and Indian reserves and is where dozens of indigenous women have vanished or their bodies found, thus giving it the name, the Highway of Tears. Because the highway is remote and isolated, perpetrators feel senses of impunity, privacy, and ability to easily carry out their crimes and hide the evidence. 28-year-old Pamela George was brutally murdered along this highway. She was a teen single mom of three. Her mother described her as the shy type and that she loved to do crafts, draw, and write poems. She moved to Regina, Saskatchewan from the Sacome Indian Reserve to work in the sex industry so that she could provide for her children. On the morning of April 18th, 1995, Pamela's body was discovered face down in a roadside ditch near Regina. Two white middle-class male athletes from the nearby university got drunk and went out looking to commit their heinous crime. One of them hid in the car while the other lured Pamela into the car. Pamela panicked after the car stopped at a gravel road and the other killer jumped out of the trunk. They kidnapped Pamela, raped her, beat her for trying to escape, and left her dead. Her killer spoke openly, almost gloated, about Pamela's murder. One telling a friend, quote, we drove around, got drunk, and killed this chick. She deserved it. She was Indian, end quote. During the trials, the judge reminded the jury that she was a sex worker, implying that Pamela, who was raped, beaten, and murdered, had consented. Her killers were only sentenced to six and a half years in prison for manslaughter. One of them was granted parole after only serving half that time. She was worthy of a life. I am resilient for Pamela. Now I ask you, have you heard the stories of Selena? Aubrey, Pamela, what about others? Can you name an indigenous sister who has been missing or murdered? Have you read in your local paper stories of indigenous women, girls, or trans going missing or murdered? Have you seen this on your television screen? 
look, we just shared this information and these truths and stories with you. Media outlets do not report on missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, trans, and two-spirit cases and continue to portray us as stereotypes, even deserving of violence. We are erased and disregarded as, not as victims, not of racism, systemic inequities, and colonial violence, but as victims of our own addictions, circumstances, and choosing. We remain invisible while our sisters, our life givers, and our community members are being stolen, taken from us, and are not receiving the justice that they deserve. This is a global crisis. It is estimated that 600 to 700 indigenous women in Guatemala are killed every year, and this gendered violence has deep roots. During the Guatemalan Civil War, the government targeted indigenous women when 90% of the more than 100,000 women raped during the war were indigenous Mayans. Today in Mexico, indigenous women make up over 15% of the population. Of that, approximately 80% of indigenous Mexicans experience extreme poverty. Indigenous women living in undeveloped areas have access to fewer resources and economic opportunities and are subjected to violence in everyday situations. However, are not afforded the luxury of safety. This includes simply trying to take public transportation to get to work so they can provide for their families. And in doing so, they must put themselves at risk of never coming home because they could be stolen in broad daylight to be trafficked. 70% 70 per, 70 of human trafficking victims in Mexico are indigenous women, making indigenous women particularly vulnerable to violence. How can we address this? One way is through legal reform. Indigenous women deserve to be at the forefront of policies because they're disproportionately affected by the crisis. However, like many places in the Western world, indigenous people are severely underrepresented in their government. Only five out of 500 legislators in the Mexican Congress identify as indigenous and they're all males. In comparison, in the United States, two out of 535 congressional seats are held by indigenous women. And to date, no indigenous woman has ever been elected into the Senate. And it wasn't until this past year where the current presidential administration appointed the first ever indigenous woman into his cabinet as a secretary of interior. It is clear that indigenous women do not have an equitable voice in politics and are victims of decisions that are made for them and not by them. Our sisters are worthy and deserving of accountability, visibility, and justice. And the reality is we know we are worthy of more. And though as indigenous women, we are forced to navigate a world that was not meant for us, we must remember that because of the blood that runs through our veins, the brilliant shade of our skin and what lies between our hips that makes us the protectors, preservers and life givers of our people. Women are the backbone of our society. Women are warriors. It is the women who carry the culture, the language, our identity, which runs through us and brings life into the communities that we raise. Though this is who we really are, media does not portray us this way. We continue to only be depicted as sexual and exotic. Costumes reduce us to a submissive, sexy Indian caricature. We are depicted as either only an Indian princess, noble, civilized, virgin, and a good Indian, or as a squaw, wild, savage, dirty, uncivilized, and lustful. In movies and media, we exist only within this binary, as an Indian princess or a squaw, never the hero of our own stories. Myths we all know, like Disney's Pocahontas, the free-spirited, beautiful, feminine, native woman who runs through the forest barely clothed, talking to animals, falls in love with a white man, and betrays her own people. Or you may remember Tiger Lily in Peter Pan, innocent and saved by a white man. These myths exist in pure fantasy and are far from the truth. Did you know that Pocahontas was only 10 years old when settlers arrived? Did you know she never met John Smith and was kidnapped by colonists and raped while in captivity? They wanted to civilize her, so she was forced to convert to Christianity and brought to England, 
where she died at the young age of 21 and has never been returned to her people. What about Sacagawea? Did you know that she was captured and forced into a non-consensual marriage at the young age of 13? Or did your history class focus on the romanticized version of Lewis and Clark and the expedition? Disney, media corporations, history books paint over the truth to better fit society as the idea of who they believe an indigenous woman should be. The perceptions can make us feel that who we are is less than human, even cause us to believe that we are not worthy of compassion, love, or humanity. We become resentful of our identity when society continues to dehumanize and over-sexualize us, like we are erotic beings only here to serve the white man's gaze and desires and fantasies. We have seen this when a little Indian girl goes missing. Well, what was she wearing? Was she drinking too much? She was asking for it. She comes from a rough family. She probably abuses drugs and alcohol. She was promiscuous anyway. She probably liked it. She lives on a reservation, so who cares? She deserved it because she was an Indian. No one will notice that she's gone. She's just another statistic. That doesn't make her life any less sacred than me. She was my sister. She was my mother, my daughter, a life. She was resilient and worthy. And that is why we all have a responsibility to the next generation of little Indian girls who come after us. We owe this to our daughters, our granddaughters, and our future ancestors. We will no longer allow society to define us by these perceptions, these stereotypes, but what science and data tells us. We will not allow them to define our beauty or our worth. We will remain resilient and create a world that is safe for little Indian girls, but we cannot do it alone. Now that you've heard our stories and our truths, you have a responsibility to help protect us, to help protect our sisters, our daughters, and our sacred life givers. We will not allow our sisters to be forgotten and for their stories to remain invisible, and neither should you. Will you commit to standing up for our sisters with us? It is long past time to start loving and respecting Native women, girls, trans, and two-spirit, and you can show that love by speaking out against injustice and violence, amplify the stories of those who look like me and Kendra. Elect Native women into positions of power. Support Indigenous artists, Indigenous films that cast Indigenous actors. Stop appropriating us with mascots and costumes. Invest in Native women leadership and programs that we run, like the Center for Native American Youth. Love and cherish us, little Indian girls, for who we really are. We are your sisters. We are resilient and worthy. Little Indian girl, you were hated for who you are, harassed for who you are, killed for who you are, silenced for who you are. You hated who you are. What makes your skin glow brown and cheekbones high, the memory of matriarchs before you buried deep within, little Indian girl. Yet this world makes no effort to see your beauty if you don't wear buckskin or have braided hair, that you can't be who your ancestors fought for, born of those who bore their blood for you to be a little Indian girl. You don't look like an Indian to me. My favorite movie was Pocahontas when I was little, but you don't really look like her. Their privileged words suffocate the room like this world was only meant for those pale, bigoted, and loud. A reminder that when women like you go missing and murdered, our cries are choked by a white hand that seethes. You're just a little Indian girl. Yet you kick, you fight, you scream, just like your auntie said, because never can they muzzle this little Indian girl. And just like the women before you who survived genocide, rape, murder, removal, assimilation, for your skin to glimmer brown and cheekbones to stand high, for you to be a gift from creation, we need little Indian girls to be proud of who they are, to know they are irreplaceable, to know they are loved, to know they are precious and sacred, to carry on the medicine of our ancestors, 
to walk in the beauty they were meant for. And this is why I'll always be a little Indian girl, resilient and worthy.